class. This is the Adorno class. Here comes Jenilyn. <laughs> Jenilyn, just oh, let's Good see. Good morning. Jenilyn Conan. Ah, uh, yes. Oh no, Jenilyn. <laughs> Okay, there goes our... My apologies, YouTube. Well, we also have to turn mm. off the Wi-Fi. That may not have already happened. No, I think, I think that's off. Okay. I think we should be good. Okay, so before we begin, I just want to say, if you'd like to download the audio for this class and the study notes and everything else, including the master class, go to our Patreon, which is www.patreon.com dash and Julian, or click the link in our bio. You can find all the information there. <laughs> and to all of our existing patrons who are getting us closer and closer to 100 patrons, thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot to us. We love engaging with you on Discord, on Clubhouse, getting your feedback, getting <laughs> your requests. It really is a very thought-provoking and a nice experience for us to sort of grow this community. So thank you. It's nice because I feel like we're at the point now where I don't have to worry about this project. Mm. Like the first six weeks, you're yes. just so focused on launching it. <laughs> whereas now I feel like, you know, we've already done well. Mm -hmm. This is already considered a success. And as long as we just keep doing it, we should be getting better at it. Hopefully, yeah. I think. So um, we're also going to be just a brief announcement. The $25 tier, mm. uh, the one where we want to publish, is going to be a subscription tier. And before we reach $1,000, we're going to be sending out our very first subscription to those people. So if you sign up to the $25 tier, mm -hmm. then this month you will be receiving our very first Jenlene and Julian curated mm -hmm. subscription package mm -hmm. delivered to you. Mm -hmm. We currently have four people receiving that. Yes. And so if you're interested in receiving a Jenlene and Julian package with... <laughs> As of yet, unannounced goodies. and mysterious goodies, <laughs> literary goodies, um, everything you need to study, head over to www.patreon.com, dash Jolene and Julian, and uh, that's fun for us. So yes. we're happy that people are subscribing to that because we love sending things to people. Speaking of sending things to people, uh, earlier last month, we sent out over a hundred cards to all of you on Instagram mm -hmm. and YouTube and TikTok and wherever people are all around the world and they went all around the world and that was delightful for us so if you've gotten your card send us a picture put in a story yeah I don't know someone's been asking us uh, about our address to send us something back oh, yeah I feel like at the end of this class, we I think can... we've given out our address a couple of times. At the end of this DMS class, maybe. We... Yeah, DMS, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> so, shall we just begin? Yeah, the car doesn't have an address, but we have an address. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, let us yeah, begin. Yeah, I'm gonna jump out at some point to grab coffee. That's wonderful. Thank but you so much for doing yes, that. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody, so we're going to be talking about ideology. No mm. surprise there. This is the sixth <laughs> lecture in the ideology class. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says, will Julian notice me? Consider it done, my friend. Alusha <laughs> Awazi. Um, now, here's the, here's the thing. If you're joining this class for the very first time, mm -hmm. welcome. It's wonderful that you are here. Yes. Uh, every class can be viewed standalone. They're all designed as introductions. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be accessible for people who don't have a background in philosophy. Yes. However, they also work as a series mm -hmm. and all the topics link into each other. So if you've enjoyed this class, please consider either watching previous classes, all saved on IGTV, or joining us next week. Same and if, time, same and, place. And one last plug, if you want the full learning experience, you should really consider joining our seminar, which takes mm. place right after this <laughs> lecture, immediately following on Clubhouse and on Discord, because we have a Discord Clubhouse eavesdropping channel. Mm -hmm. And if you, need a, if you need an invite to Clubhouse, you can get in touch with us and we'll get you hooked up. That's $5 a month on Patreon, mm -hmm. uh, which gives you eight seminars per month, which is not a bad deal for five bucks. I feel like I'm spending more than five bucks just on, on coffee, coffee here this morning. <laughs> Okay, enough plugging. I'm also going to show off this pencil, by the way. This is not like a brand plug. This is just the most beautiful pencil I've ever used. It's wonderful. Okay, so this is the intro to ideology class. You can watch it both here on Instagram and on YouTube if you would like to see Jenaline in a widescreen format and myself. Go head over to YouTube. Um, yes. Let's introduce YouTube to Instagram for a moment here. I don't know if it's... Hello! Be nice to each other. Okay. Okay, now we're actually beginning. All right. So, I'm going to focus more on Adorno. Mm. Theodor W. Adorno, probably the most well-known member of the Frankfurt School. 
and a proponent of critical theory. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, every the way that this series is structured is we have 12 hours. Which sounds crazy when you say it like that. <laughs> 12 hours, mm -hmm. and that is four times three lectures. Mm -hmm. So basically, there's blocks of three. Mm -hmm. And the first block of three that we did really focused on Althusserian ideology right. and the Althusserian conception of ideology's interpolation. Mm -hmm. So we started with saying, what is ideology not? What is ideology? And then how does ideology work? Those right. are the first three classes. Then we went into the second one mm -hmm. where the overarching question for the second set of three, mm -hmm. so four, five, the six, trio, the right. second trio, mm -hmm. or triad, if you want to be Hegelian, because <laughs> it's more of a triad than a trio, is... Um, <laughs> What is the role of the individual mm -hmm. apropos ideology? What is the role of subjectivity? And we started with a classic Greek ancient, which Foucault uses as well, problem, which is the problem of how learning requires a passive stance mm -hmm. in order to have information to be an active agent in the world and how being and becoming are related which then led us last week to talk about existentialism. We did a lot about Sartre in mm -hmm. particular. And today we're going to focus on Adorno. And Adorno, in a sense, responds to the existentialist by means of a very different theory of subjectivity and ideology. Mm. And we're going to wrap it up by introducing what the role of the subject is in psychoanalytic theory. Because I'm not here to just toot Adorno's <laughs> horn. I want to introduce Adorno, but I don't think Adorno has the answers here. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Sounds good. Okay. I like the I like the overview. That helps. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, there is a plan, my friends. There's <laughs> definitely there's definitely a plan. I just try not to go on about it because like whole the whole point of the dialectical teaching style is that you are in it, mm -hmm. where it's unfolding in your own heads, and so we shouldn't be spelling it out. But you know, there we go. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it helps. <laughs> exactly. Um, do you need to get coffee, or do you want to just? I'm gonna start? go see if it's. I'm gonna go see if it's ready. Will you feel abandoned? No. Okay. I, yeah, I'll feel. T <laughs> I'll totally abandon. <laughs> All right. So those of you who um, are on our Discord, our Discord group, generally is trying to close the door very quietly, which just is more distracting for me than a bang. But Jeneline, uh yesterday was very uh, busy making a wonderful Easter meal for us. And what I was doing was that I was on the Discord. And we were launching our book group. And in our book group, we are reading Zizek's The Ticklish Subject. And so what I did is in the voice chat, I gave an hour-long lecture, uh, like a private lecture for people on Discord, where I talked about subjectivity and about the ticklish subject. So for those of you who joined that lecture yesterday, um, there's going to be some repeated material here because some of those ideas are still in my head. Just a, just a heads up, as it were. A literal, a literal heads up. Um, and, and so, so that's something that we did on the Discord, and that sort of feeds into this here. Now, I've recently been... I really got into a Netflix show. There's a show on Netflix that I really got into, and it's, it's a show about Formula One driving, so race car driving. And I know nothing about Formula One. Formula One is not something I ever thought about. I like sports, but I don't tend to like motorsports. And I watched an episode of this Netflix series. I don't even know what it's called. Formula One Drive to Survive, something like this. And uh, it's sort of like documentary slash reality TV. They have full access to everything that happens during these Formula One races. You get to know the drivers, the, the crew, all that stuff. Very exciting. And what I didn't know about, I mean, there's so much I didn't know about Formula One. But one thing really interests me from a philosophical perspective, which is, in most sports, you have an athlete who is the best at what they do because of certain qualities that they have when it comes to physicality. Like a basketball player is really tall, really good at dribbling, really good at shooting or passing, whatever. Someone who's good at running is just really fast at running. But when it comes to race car drivers, their job is not necessarily to be the best driver. I mean, in a sense, they have to be, but how do you define the best driver? Well, it depends on the car. And so there's this peculiar thing that I hadn't seen in other sports. Perhaps you might have it in like horse, uh, I don't know, like, uh, I forget what it's called, like where they jump over things with horses. Um, where one, you have the car and then you have the driver. And the driver's job is to take that car 
to the place it has never been before. In other words, to take that car to the limit and in the process of finding that limit of the car to be able to learn how to drive the car in an environment that hasn't been tested. Because when you're pushing the car to that level under those circumstances, it hasn't been tested. And so the, the particular skill that the race car driver has is can he, because these are men, can he learn how to use this car under those conditions that are unpredictable? And it's in a sense, one of the things that happens is that it's not so much that the driver is driving the car, it's that the car is driving the driver. The car has primacy in a sense. Hello, Jolene. Hey. I'm talking about Formula One because that's <laughs> been my obsession recently. And what's really interesting to me here is I'm talking about the way in which for Formula One driving, it's it's the car and the driver. Mm -hmm. And it's more that the car is driving the driver <laughs> rather than vice versa. Nice. And the particular challenge that the driver has to learn how to drive the car in conditions that have never been tested. Like that. Yeah, and we didn't realize how little time the driver gets with the car before no actually. Testing, yeah. yeah, and because every test ride that the driver does is still kind of a timed race. Like it's it determines yeah. their their position for the ultimate race. I know that's very full cup. That's okay. Um so why am I talking about Formula One here? And what the hell does it have to do with the door now? <laughs> well, it has to do with a certain relationship between the material and the ideal and uh, the role of subjectivity and individuality here. Mm -hmm. I wanna, and I talked about this in the Discord already a little bit, but like when you go to university, there's usually a distinction between the humanities and the sciences. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the way in which we know that is, I mean, the way in, our, our assumptions are that the humanities are empirical and that the sciences <laughs> are rigorous, a yeah. rigorous and that humanities are a bit wishy-washy, <laughs> you're into poetry and languages and stuff like this. Um, but in German, if you go to a German university, mm -hmm. it's a much more intuitive distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. And one that is much more true to the tradition, which is sciences are referred to as Naturwissenschaften. So the general grouping of sciences is Naturwissenschaften, mm -hmm. natural sciences. And humanities are referred to as Geisteswissenschaften, mm -hmm. which is the science of spirit. Mm -hmm. And... Geisteswissenschaften in the sense that, it, and, and so rather than seeing humanities as like this frivolous offset of the more serious rational science, like a derivative. it's yeah. its own science. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we sometimes lose a little bit of track of, I think, mm -hmm. is the idea that there is a science of the humanities mm -hmm. and that there's a science of human spirit and that that science is philosophy. Philosophy is specifically intended to be a science. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Marxism is designed to be a science and all this dialectics is designed to be a science, like all mm -hmm. these things. Um, so, so there's that, that confusion that I think in German is less confusing in mm -hmm. a sense. We have mm -hmm. the science of the spirit and we have the science of uh, nature. I like that. I want to start calling it science of the spirit. Well, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and, it's, and I don't even mean to say that just for semantics yeah, yeah. in the sense, because mm -hmm. what's funny about this is we have this idea that the natural sciences mm -hmm. are uh, empirical in nature, which they should be. But that doesn't mean that they don't incorporate a sense of the ideal. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity. You don't test that in a room somewhere. Mm. On a certain level, the theory comes about on the level of the ideal. Mm -hmm. And through mathematical... Well, abstract mathematics. Abstract ma mathematical formulations and all yeah. this. You have to create the intellectual space to think of the theory of relativity mm -hmm. by means of creating an ideal environment. Mm -hmm. You can't just drop an apple out of a tree and say, <laughs> we have gravity here, basically, mm -hmm. right? So there's always a, a, a certain level at which the ideal is at work within the natural sciences right. as well as the material. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's a certain primacy given to the material over the ideal. Um, and that's where the, the driving, the Formula One driving is quite interesting to me because you think about it, it's a very material sport, mm -hmm. which is the development of a supercar. Yep. And uh, a car that can do, go, I don't know, 395 kilometers an hour or something, mm -hmm. like 200 mm -hmm. miles, an hour, I don't know what it is. And at the same time, to create such a car is to work entirely in the realm of the ideal, which is what will this material car do at its limit? No one's interested in what the car can do. Mm -hmm. People are interested in what is that space that can't be defined, like the Dunkelziffer almost, mm -hmm. that we can push the car into right. 
that place that we can't determine. Yeah. And it's not just undeterminable because of the variables, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, debris or wind or heat. Or even so. they're talking about, like, a race in Malaysia, I think, or Singapore, Singapore, where the heat and the humidity are so high, you don't really know how the car is going to perform. And those are such important variables. Yeah. That, and so there's mm-hmm. a certain amount that you can do on a material level. Right. But then what actually the sport is, mm-hmm. the reason it is a sport mm-hmm. and not a science, mm-hmm. Is where the spirit comes in right. because the driver is not just the passive agent of i am the person steering the car the driver is the person who has to intuit where the car's upper limit is the point where the car breaks mm-hmm. and explodes basically or crashes and the point at which the car is not reaching that limit right and there's something like you should really watch the show because there's something very Hegelian about this moment where the driver goes into like this night of the world place, mm-hmm. which is just utter pure adrenal experience. Mm-hmm. Everything is done on pure intuition. Mm-hmm. It goes faster than the mind can take in. Right. And if the car crashes, if the thing can't do it, if the ideal limit is reached, mm-hmm. then the driver is considered a failure. <laughs> and if they somehow manage to navigate that very liminal mm-hmm. space, mm-hmm. the driver is considered successful. Mm-hmm. And the, the margin of error is <laughs> non-existent because yeah. the definition of success mm-hmm. is the margin of error itself. Mm-hmm. It's like the exact opposite of climbing. <laughs> like Jen and I do a lot of climbing. And when you climb, you're very, very health and safety conscious. <laughs> and you never go to that point where you really are pushing yourself. Like you're never going to push the gear. Right. You'll push yourself, but not the gear. Mm-hmm. And with the racing, you don't push yourself. The whole point is that you have to successfully push the material gear, the car. Right. So anyway, I realize that's like an extended riff. I'm sorry about that. I know it's like a 10 minute riff, but like, <laughs> I want to introduce like a certain theory of like, you know, subjectivity here and the relation between the material and the ideal um, that relates to psychoanalysis as well. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about it, like psychoanalysis is a material practice that always exists on the level of the ideal. And what I mean by that is that psychoanalysis uh, exists in a world that needs psychoanalysis, but at the same time doesn't understand what psychoanalysis is. So the funny thing is that most people think of psychoanalysis as therapy, something Mm -hmm. that I can do to adjust myself or fix myself or treat treat myself or Mm -hmm. be less less toxic in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the definition of psychotherapy for someone like Adorno is that psychotherapy is a theory for critiquing the world that doesn't understand psychotherapy. If the world understood psychotherapy, it would need psychotherapy as it were. It's one of those mm-hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it emerges as like the success element. Yeah. And that's not, to, I realized I didn't explain that very well. Part of the problem is I'm repeating some stuff from the Discord yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's important here is that psychoanalysis takes place in that blend again of the natural science and the human sciences, mm-hmm. humanities. Which is that, on the one hand, we're talking about biology. And for a long time, especially including for clinical psychologists, we just think about biology, right? It's well, like, oh, chemicals are my and brain. That's the, and that's a very American approach to psychology and um, psychological treatment, is that it's all about chemical imbalances. Yeah. And if only we can get the combination of chemicals right, then everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And... Yeah, I mean, it's uh, optimistic. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it helps. Mm-hmm. Uh, And it helps for a lot of people to think of themselves as being subject to that. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, there are chemicals and hormones that work. Mm -hmm. There are neurons that fire off. Mm -hmm. Uh, To work in the ideal realm, Mm -hmm. the realm of spirit, is not to deny organic reality. But it's not to give primacy to organic reality. Mm -hmm. And so clinical psychology gives primacy to organic reality in a way that psychoanalysis doesn't. Um, So we're going to think, and this being in this whole lecture, we're talking about the relationship between the material and the ideal is going to keep coming back. So I want to talk briefly about Adorno and all those pieces that I've introduced here are going to like come mm-hmm. back. Um, you know, there's a movie that I really like. It's, it's called uh, Hail Caesar <laughs> by the Coen brothers. I think I posted a little clip of my stories <laughs> and I'm convinced that uh, the Coen brothers read Adorno uh, because if you go to Adorno has a book, uh, a text that's called Message in a Bottle where he writes like little, little pieces, little <laughs> fragments, little like critiques of ideology. And... Um, he starts the, Adorno starts the message in a bottle collection mm-hmm. by making fun of a certain professorial type, uh, what he calls like petty bourgeois. Mm-hmm. And it's the professorial type who's completely enamored with his own particular professional identity. He's very affected. <laughs> and the way that Adorno describes him is that he says that the, uh, this type of like person, 
uh, this bourgeois individual, ten, if they give a speech, mm -hmm. they always sort of wistfully end the speech with, <laughs> you know what it is, right? <laughs> would that it were would, so simple. Would that it were so simple. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this like pretension, it's this pretension and wistfulness and feigned powerlessness that goes together in this like intellectual pretension, you know what I mean? Like the, uh, yeah. would that it were, or would that it were so simple. Yeah. And so um, I didn't actually post that clip to to the Instagram. But if you have seen Hail Caesar, I'll and post you it should to because Discord, it's a yeah. very funny movie that is a wonderful scene. And it's a scene in which a director and an actor are trying to teach each other the lines would it would that it were so simple and they have to say it like a hundred times and it's like this total like linguistic ideological misrecognition. Like the more yes. they say the words would that it were so simple, the the less it means and the harder right. it is to say. Right. It just becomes sound. It no longer has meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's so I'm convinced that the Coen brothers read Adorno. <laughs> it's also a movie that's full of jokes about like professors yes. and Christianity and, and Judaism, of course, for Critical the Coen brothers. Theorists. Critical theorists. Yeah, there's a, a George Clooney gets a kidnapped. Spoilers. George Clooney gets kidnapped by a group of communists. Spoilers. Uh, no, that's not a spoiler. I think that's not a spoiler. It's pretty good. Um, I think I did post that to the Instagram. It's, it's there's movie. like a figure who's clearly supposed to be like a Marcuse type figure uh -huh. or something who's just like talking about the dialectic. They have a little <laughs> dog. There's like a scene that's one second long where they're like they have like finger sandwiches. The communists have finger sandwiches, and there's like this little Chihuahua kind of dog or whatever, like a little poodle. I don't know what it is, and like they kind of kick it aside, and they're like, "No, Angles!" Like they call their dog Angles. Like it's so funny. Anyway, it's very good. But the reason I'm bringing up this movie is that that scene where the two actors, the director and the actor, are saying, would that it was simple? Would that it was? Like, they're going back and forth on this. Um, so this is actually not a bad way to understand what Adorno has in mind with ideology. Mm -hmm. For Adorno, ideology is when things become the same, to the point that they become meaningless. So for Adorno, ideology is, uh, what is it, homogenization. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's basically for Adorno, ideology is the the movement and the process by which things become the same to the point in which they lose their particular identity. Is it that you become acclimated to them and so you stop noticing them or you don't notice the distinction between them? It's all of that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. break it down more okay. and, and also explain at the end of this class why I think we have to also push back and disagree with okay. this. Um, so... Last week we talked about the existentialists a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the existentialists have in common is that most of them go back to Nietzsche. I mean, Kierkegaard is in many ways the founder of existentialism, mm -hmm. not because he was an existentialist, but because he wrote about the problem of existence and mm -hmm. the existent. Um, but a lot of these things come from Nietzsche as well. Mm -hmm. And both Adorno and the existentialists like Sartre are taking their cues from Nietzsche. They're just doing very different things with him. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the term that Nietzsche has for this, Nietzsche has a text about uh, truth and lies. Um, and uh, actually, tiny little plug, if you download the lecture notes for this class, mm -hmm. you can find all that <laughs> stuff. And um, so basically he's talking about what, what Nietzsche, I'm not going to explain the whole text. Um, and I actually think I wrote it down because it's really important to me that I get it right because it's a German expression. Uh, and I've got it here in like a little notebook. Um, let's see. Wrote in notebooks, by the way. The best <laughs> notebooks. I'm not getting paid for this, but I want people to know. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. So what Nietzsche calls it is mm -hmm. uh, die Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen. Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen. Now, Gleichsetzung means the, um, Gleich means same, and Setzung means placement. So it's the putting, it's the placing, uh, no, let me, it's like the smoothening out. Gleichsetzung mm. is to equate, to equate okay. something. So, Gleichsetzung is equation, mm -hmm. and Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen, Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen, yeah. Nicht, you probably know, right? That. Yeah, exactly. So, and is it the smoothing, the smoothing that doesn't even things out? No. Yeah, that's a very poetic way okay. of saying it. It's the equation of the mm -hmm. non-equitable, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's the process by which you take something that isn't the same, right. something that is non-identical, mm -hmm. and you make it identical. Yeah. And so what's really important here, the Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen, mm -hmm. is we're starting to talk about identity here. Mm. And um, of course, you probably have all heard to death about identity politics and identity, but there's a very rich philosophical tradition of the problem of identity mm -hmm. that has informed some of those theories, like mm -hmm. post-structuralism. But, but I would probably bet that most people have never heard of, and that's okay. So the Gleichsetzung des mm -hmm. Nichtgleichen is the equation mm -hmm. of the non 
same. The mm -hmm. sameness of the non-same. Mm -hmm. And the example that Nietzsche uses, which if you've watched the previous class, you will remember was something that uh, Sartre also thinks about, mm -hmm. is the relationship of a leaf to a tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this class, you may recall, I said that Sartre was offended by the existence of trees. <laughs> And that seemed like a little bit, like, I say a lot of random things, but that seemed particularly <laughs> random. And at the time I said, this goes back to Nietzsche, I will get there. And <clears throat> basically Sartre feels offended by trees because he's walking through the park, mm -hmm. I don't know, presumably in mm -hmm. Paris, uh, Jardin Luxembourg or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why do these trees exist for me? Mm -hmm. Why are these trees asking to be acknowledged by me? Why are there things in the world that are not me? Like, it's basically mm -hmm. like he feels offended by the thingness of objects. Mm. Objects that don't have a point of their own, seemingly, but need to be taken in by me. Mm. It's very Sartrean in this sense, right? It's just sort of like, it's not even asking why, but it's asking why would I have to ask why? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason there, it's not just Sartre being difficult, because it's essentially the same pet peeve that Nietzsche has, which is Nietzsche says, when I have a leaf in my hand, mm -hmm. what we have here and it's almost like a Plato thing, Platonic mm -hmm. here. The concept of leaf is not contained in this leaf. There is a universal truth of leafness, mm -hmm. pure leaf. Again, Platonic, right? Mm -hmm. And this leaf is, in a sense, a particular contingent, i.e. accidental, copy of pure concept of leaf. And so what I hold here is particular leaf, but it doesn't tell me anything about pure ideal leaf it's a material shadow of the pure form of leaf right again this is clearly not an aristotelian way of looking at the world this is about a platonic theory but for plato that's true of everything and that's not related to the relationship between the leaf and the tree so are you saying that that the existentialists take it a step further and say that it's a, it's not just about the leaf being a copy of pure form leaf but being being treated as the same as the tree so I'm actually less interested in what the existentialists have to say here because okay. we kind of did that last week. Yeah, uh, yeah. What's important here, and I'll, because mm. uh, you're right to ask, because it seems like it's not like oh that's such an amazing insight. Like it seems it seems kind of dumb, mm. basically. But what's important here is that we're talking about the relationship between the universal and the particular. Okay. So the universal is on the level of the concept, or what Nietzsche would call begriff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the German word for concept is mm -hmm. der Begriff. Mm -hmm. uh, begriff. If you go into like a dictionary, begriff will actually usually be um, uh, translated as term. Mm but it's not term, it's concept. Mm -hmm. And so the pure form, the ideal form of something right. versus its accidental manifestations on earth. Okay. Does that make sense? So do we have access through the leaf mm -hmm. to the truth of the leaf? Is there something in the leaf that gives us the truth of the leaf or okay. of nature or whatever, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, don't dwell too much on this because yeah, it's yeah. not the most important part. What's important here is that what Nietzsche is saying is that when we look at the leaf, we assume that this leaf is true for all leaves. Mm. It becomes the leaf for us, mm -hmm. as it were. We just think of this as like the universal leaf. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's not. It's simply one of a gazillion leaves that you probably just trample over. Mm -hmm. And so there's that process by which we take things that are non-identical, different leaves, okay. and we treat them as if they were a universal substance. Right. And Again, like, you ask yourself, like, why does this matter? It doesn't seem particularly important. And, and I'll agree with you there. Like, at the end of the day, like, this is the kind of philosophizing that gets it's a, a... It's a garden thought. Well, it gets a bad <laughs> reputation, right? Because it has this idea, oh, the mm -hmm. philosopher is creating pseudo-problems. Mm -hmm. Like, that's sort of on, mm -hmm. on the level of pseudo-problem here. And, and so I don't want it to rest there. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be pretentious, I think. But where Adorno is coming in here is Adorno is saying that ideology is identity thinking. And the reason that Adorno says that ideology is identity thinking has nothing to do with identity politics. I mean, there's something to do with identity politics, but not for Adorno. Yeah, right. He's not saying that to be interested in, I don't know, critical race theory, for example, is ideology. That's mm -hmm. not his point. Mm -hmm. His point is that ideology is identity thinking because identity thinking is never about a direct correspondence with how something is. It's always a non-correspondence. So we can only mm. understand ideal leaf through the contingent, accidental, impure leaf. The encounters with leaf in nature. Ex with leaf in nature. Okay. But dialectically mediated, it's also vice versa. We mm -hmm. have no concept of pure form of leaf mm -hmm. without 
lesser leaf, as it were, <laughs> leaf that I happen to accidentally hold in my hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so identity thought, identity here is process of differentiation. It's the Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen. Mm -hmm. It's the making the same of what is not same. Right. Uh, for those of you who study philosophy, you'll see here a foreshadowing of where we're going, which is the role of uh, difference mm -hmm. uh, when we go into deconstructionism and post-structuralism. But that's for another <laughs> class. That's for next time. We're building up very slowly. So I want to take a step back from Adorno here mm -hmm. because we, we're not quite there yet because mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, misguided and uh, misleading mm -hmm. to suggest that Adorno is Nietzschean strictly speaking, but that's the root of this problem. Because when we just see ideologies, identity thinking, we say, whoa, that, like it's it doesn't, really hard to understand yeah. where it's coming from. Um, now, where Adorno has no truck with the existentialists mm -hmm. is that he says that the existentialists, we talked about this in the seminar last week as well, have this misconception that the self, subjectivity, individuality, mm -hmm. me, is some kind of untouched, pure, logical ground on which experience is based. Mm -hmm. And that the one thing that you can take for granted is the integrity of the self. Right. This is like the Descartian cogito. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, therefore, I am. It's the self-transparent subject. Mm -hmm. The subject who sees himself. That is the point of solitude and the point of security mm -hmm. in the world. Well, uncertainty. Both, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. And for Adorno, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Adorno says it's false to assume that there is a primacy of either the subject, the individual experience, mm -hmm. or that there's primacy over the uh, non-identical, the thing that the ideal, as it were. Right. Um, so, when you hear this, you immediately start thinking, well, this is because Adorno is in some ways a Marxist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and many, I mean, Adorno is a Marxist. He's mm -hmm. just not like a dogmatic, vulgar Marxist. He doesn't believe, like, there's, we could do a whole class on what Adorno <laughs> believes and doesn't believe, because it's very complicated. Like, Adorno doesn't believe in the idea of the revolutionary agent. He doesn't mm -hmm. believe in the idea of class struggle in the same way that Marx is, etc. But that's for another time, my friends, <laughs> or the seminar. And, but I want to go back to Marx for a moment, and mm -hmm. this is where you can help me a little bit, which is, um, we've talked a little bit about use value and exchange value. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, you're getting there, I guess? Mm -hmm. right? We'll get there, yeah. We'll get there, okay. I know it's something you talk about yeah, a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, exchange value is a form of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Because you have two things that are exchanged. Mm -hmm. I know you don't believe in the barter economy, but for the <laughs> sake of argument. Two things that are exchanged. Well, it's mediated by money, let's say. Yeah. That are assumed mm -hmm. to be of equal value. Mm -hmm. In other words, they can be bartered or they can be traded. Mm -hmm. Um like a goat for a bag of oats or something like yeah, this. Yeah, and it's mediated through price. Once you once you have equivalent values, once you say a goat is worth X amount of money and a bag of oats is worth X amount of money, right. you have a common factor, which is money. But you're actually, if I may say so, yeah. as far as I understand it, I think that you're actually jumping the gun. Okay, because probably, you've, yes. Because you've gone straight to money, mm -hmm. but the equation that's taking place is actually the equation of the value of the labor, mm. as far as I understand it. Because we're saying that the labor, you can't determine how much labor goes into a goat. Mm -hmm. You can't really determine how much labor goes into a bag of oats. So we're already abstracting a certain assumption of what the labor is that goes into that value. Yes. Right? But yeah. you're right. Money would be a denominator of that. Yeah. Totally true. And you know, first of all, Jelly knows more about Marx than I do. So this is not me trying it's to not be a different... the Marx expert. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what Marx is basically saying here... And as a, as a principle, and this, again, is not economics. This is nothing like high and mighty. It's more philosophical. It's like more abstract. Is that when we exchange something, mm -hmm. we've created an equivalence, mm -hmm. which, strictly speaking, is a false equivalence. That doesn't mean that it's not good. Mm -hmm. It's not a normative assessment. Mm -hmm. But a goat is not a bag of oats. Mm -hmm. There is a false equivalence between these two, mm -hmm. which is a fruitful false equivalence, because right. now we've created something. We've created social relations. Mm -hmm. We've created a form of exchange. Mm -hmm. And so Adorno, and again, I'm not necessarily agreeing with Adorno, I'm just mm -hmm. setting this up. Mm -hmm. Adorno is saying that that process, the process of false equivalence, mm -hmm. is where ideology enters the room. It's because we have two people in this hypothetical situation who are pretending that something is of equal value mm -hmm. and making a trade based on that assumption. Right. And for Adorno, it's not just a question of 
how does that happen? It's a question of how is that solidified? What is the consensus that emerges where people understand that one thing is worth as much as something else mm -hmm. without having to like spend a year doing empirical analysis mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it? It's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's funny because like you can see the Althusserian part here, mm -hmm. the interpolation right. in a sense. Are you, are you, yeah, you seem yeah, no, very I'm against this No, 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 I'm following. I'm You're following? Yeah. Okay. So what, what Ardorno is basically doing is he's, he's taken like the, he's kind of done a little bit of a blend between Nietzsche and Marx here, mm -hmm. which is like, once you start understanding the Frankfurt School, you see that a lot of that's happening. And it's the idea that there's Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen. When we read that in Nietzsche, the equation of the non-identical, uh, the, the, the whatever, mm -hmm. uh, he just says, well, that's something that Marx does as well. Mm -hmm. And Marx does it through the idea of exchange value. Right. That's basically Adorno's basic idea. Mm -hmm. And then Adorno's criticism, which he sort of then expands over time, is that this increases to the point in which everything is treated that way. Everything becomes a form of exchange value. And because everything becomes a form of exchange value, mm -hmm. we've completely abstracted what the thing is, and we've created false equivalences everywhere. Yeah. And it's not to say that everything is the same. Mm -hmm. It's to say that the process by which we make things appear the same, mm -hmm. even if they're different, are the process of ideology mm -hmm. and the process of what he calls identity thinking. Because identity thinking is when we've taken something that is not in sync with what its pure form is. For Marx, it's the detachment of exchange value from use value. Mm -hmm. And we've created that as the standard. We've given primacy to the 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 identity of it. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, right? absolutely. No, that's a really good way to think about it. It's kind it. of like, and it's kind of important that we do that step by step because uh, if you read the uh, ideology reader mm -hmm. that we're using for this class that I put in the lecture notes, mm -hmm. uh, there's a really good piece called Ideology and Its Vicissitudes, Vicissitudes mm -hmm. by uh, Terry Eagleton. And Terry Eagleton is really harsh on Marx here because Terry Eagleton makes the, not on Marx, <coughs> harsh on Adorno. Terry Eagleton makes the totally valid argument against Adorno, mm -hmm. which he says, wait a minute, doesn't capitalism today, as we know it, mm -hmm. celebrate and advertise and sell and make consumable the idea of difference? Everyone should be their best self. Everyone should be creative. Everyone should distinguish themselves through whatever creed they may have. Nobody mm -hmm. is the same. And that we associate totalitarianism with the straight jacket of uniformity. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense what, and if you think about even not just capitalism, but like what Zizek would call the supplemental feature of capitalism today, which is liberal multiculturalism yeah. and a democratic uh, participation, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. that celebrates uh, uh, different identities mm -hmm. and the Coalition. melting pot yeah. and all that stuff, right? So that becomes mm -hmm. part of that. So the argument against Adorno immediately would be to say, wait a minute, Cap it's it's misguided to say that capitalism makes everything the same mm -hmm. until like all life has died. Instead, capitalism actually diversifies. Mm -hmm. Capitalism creates the ideology of capitalism isn't a straitjacket. It's the ideology of capitalism is to diversify, diversify, diversify. Mm -hmm. That's the argument that Terry Eagleton makes against Adorno, which is which is a fair enough argument, mm -hmm. uh, but it it it's not patient enough to work through the origins of that argument that Adorno's making. Because if you think about it, this process of false equivalence, mm -hmm. of the uh, creating something that is equal in exchange value, even though it isn't actually equal in what it is, right. is the process by which we create differentiation onto something that was already differentiated, which we're now treating as pure. In other words, mm -hmm. let's say you've got the leaf mm -hmm. and you've got like the pure leaf, which we can't access, mm -hmm. and the contingent leaf in the world. Adorno is basically saying that if we take the material leaf in the world mm -hmm. and we say this is the pure leaf, then that pure leaf has its own uh, like particular derivations. derivation. And so we get stuck. And this is like why for Adorno, negative dialectics is the unwinding of dialectical mm -hmm. participation to mm -hmm. get back to like original dialectical participation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. How much time do we have? I feel like, is this getting too hard? No, no, it's, it's 43 after. I think we're sort of okay. Okay. Uh, so we've set up... Yeah, want... it's really interesting. I think that the discussion of use value and exchange value is really, you're right, is really helpful. And maybe that is something to, to cover. Because I think that part of it is that it seems as though, let's say, the ideology of consumerism 
is not is to say that a particular product is in some way extraordinary, even though we know that like detergent is detergent, dish soap is dish soap. I mean, cereal is kind of. I talked about this in the previous class. Yeah. Remember, we had this uh, theme about hair washing. Mm -hmm. And I basically said, for Sartre, mauvaise foi mm -hmm. is when you think that you are differentiating yourself by means of either opting out mm -hmm. or by making an educated decision. Right. And the two versions of that are one. Let's say you go into a supermarket and there's 50 versions of shampoo. Mm -hmm. And you decide, I'm actually going to be a free emancipated subject because I don't need shampoo. I'm going to mm -hmm. opt out of this. Mm -hmm. But for Sartre, that's an ideological illusion because it's just self-reflection. Right. Or you could be the bourgeois, middle-class, professorial type, which perhaps you could count myself to, who says, I distinguish myself because I can identify quality. Mm -hmm. I know the difference between different types of leather mm -hmm. or different types of paper mm -hmm. or what a good record player is. And so I'm going to make the educated consumer choice. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, so... But both of those, yeah. for an existentialist, are mauvaise foi. Both mm -hmm. of those are false consciousness because you still haven't eliminated the problem, which is the problem of that false choice in the first place. You're, you're still making the choice. Okay. Except, so, the first one who says, I'm not going to wash my hair, I'm not going to buy I'm shampoo. Not participate. They've basically opted out of deciding altogether, mm -hmm. uh, which could be revolutionary. I mean, we'll get to that. And then the other one has said, I'm going to choose, but I'm going to make a more educated choice than everybody else. I'm mm -hmm. going to feel like mm -hmm. I'm the... Consumer who knows better than all the other consumers okay. and in a sense like I don't want to do a whole thing on marketing here yeah, yeah. We'll get there but like when you have branding that says like you're not just coffee. You're saving mm, the planet yeah. That's exactly ideology in that sense of mauvaise foi, mm -hmm. which is you're not just buying a coffee But you're actually helping a farmer and mm -hmm. by helping the farmer you're making the world a better yeah. place and you're like like That's pretty obvious, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so why am I introducing all of this? Mm -hmm. We're still talking about subjectivity mm -hmm. here and Adorno Adorno's theory is that the Gleichsetzung des Nichtgleichen is the process by which everything slowly becomes the same. And art is supposed to be a resistance to that process. Art is supposed to be the celebration of difference and the celebration of the non-identical. Um, if you think about it, for example, Adorno is not entirely incorrect. Mm -hmm. Let's think about how movies are made or TV shows. Mm -hmm. A TV show is inherently formulaic. The, the basic premise of most good TV shows, or I mean, whatever good <laughs> means, but like most popular TV shows, like Friends or mm -hmm. something, is that, or The Office, every episode is strictly speaking the same thing, mm -hmm. except a slightly different variation. Right. And part of the enjoyment of watching TV is that you kind of know the format, you know mm -hmm. the formula, but you're enjoying the slight variation on the formula. And you see this even with like... um. Uh, or even like in the DC universe with Zack Snyder, like if you do something to the ca to the canon, mm -hmm. or you do something that makes like Superman evil or something, mm -hmm. there's a certain limit that has been exceeded of what people find comfortable within the formula, and people get right. very upset. Mm -hmm. So you you're expected to make changes within the formula. Mm -hmm. No one wants to watch the same show on repeat, mm -hmm. but there's the tacit assumption that you don't make too many changes right. because if you make too many changes then you no longer have that formula mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah and so that that's what adorno is thinking here mm -hmm. it's the slow process by which everything comes to be the same and then ideologically speaking if we mold our our psychological lives and our mm -hmm. fantasies and our mm -hmm. dreams and our mm -hmm. fears to that kind of sameness we also become more of the same mm -hmm. and it gives us access to the world we understand cues and all that stuff cultural references and at the same time, we've lost our individuality. That's the sort of pessimism Adorno has, mm -hmm. and you can understand why that is a critique of the culture industry, right. specifically, mm -hmm. and the way in which that mediatized sameness. Mm -hmm. Adorno is a total fundamentalist here. Like, for example, Adorno is even against everything that is not direct experience. Mm -hmm. Like, and this is where Adorno is secretly more existentialist than people realize. Mm -hmm. For example, Adorno is very much against the idea that you would have a live broadcast of a concert, mm -hmm. because he says you have to be there. Right. As soon as you've mediated the concert through broadcasting, mm -hmm. you've taken away something crucial. You've you started killing the live thing itself because once you become comfortable with a broadcasting or in this day and age, a live streaming or a Spotify mm -hmm. streaming, mm -hmm. you've taken one more step towards saying, actually, I don't need the thing itself. I don't need the music itself. I don't need mm -hmm. the performance or the person. Mm -hmm. Adorno is very fundamentalist in that sense. And I, I don't agree with Adorno here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. So, 
why don't I agree with Adorno here? Well, it's because of this. Adorno's theory of the subject is, to my mind, secretly making the same mistake that he accuses the existentialist of, mm. <clears throat> which is that there's a pure logical grounding of the subject. Now, what Adorno is saying, in a sense, is that straitjacketing experience mm -hmm. through homogenization. Uh, for example, in capitalism, what is it? The Earth is Flat. That's mm -hmm. the famous, uh, what's his name? Writer. The guy who does the interviews in the taxis. New York oh, Times writer. yeah, Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman, right? Yes. Thomas Friedman, who was the great sort of... Uh, early 21st century apologist of neoliberalism. of neoliberalism capitalism had this idea that it's so wonderful everything's the same mm -hmm. and the cliche is you know mcdonald's are the same everywhere <laughs> except with small variations mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. if you go into mcdonald's in holland you'll find a burger that doesn't exist here because it's a burger made to be like a takeout snack in holland stuff like this right so the homogenization of culture the homogenization of life mm -hmm. the homogenization by which everything comes to be the same or different flavors of the same right that's Adorno's criticism, which is a criticism of a certain modernity of, mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that that doesn't quite work for me, as much as I can see it manifest in the world, mm -hmm. is on the level of subjectivity, on the level of individuality, it still thinks that the subject is somehow outside of this. That there is a subject to be protected. Like a pure subject. Yeah, exactly. That, and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that some Adorno expert could probably you know, tell me otherwise. <laughs> That's fine. But the idea that there is a form of subjectivity that can be protected from the identity thinking, sort of an ideal pure subject. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, of course, Adorno is still an idealist in mm -hmm. this sense, even mm -hmm. if he may not be explicit about it. Mm -hmm. And for me, and this is where we're going to go, and what I talked about a lot in the Discord yesterday, mm -hmm. the theory of subjectivity that's important to me is very much the way in which Zizek has talked about psychoanalysis as a way of revitalizing German idealism and vice versa. And uh, specifically, you can think about it like this. If in a Freudian sense, because that's what Lacan's doing, he's radicalizing Freud. If in a Freudian sense, we have the id, the ego, and the superego, right? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Sort of classic triad. Id, pure drive, basically. Or trio. Or trio. Thank I'm you. Sorry. No, no, it's it, but the thing is, like, there's a difference between trio and triad because yeah, trio implies that there's three separate things, mm -hmm. and triad means that there's three mediated things. Mm. That's that's the difference. Like to me, that's oh, quite important. Oh, thank you. That is a good difference. Yeah, it's not just semantics. Yeah, yeah. No, um, <laughs> and so, between the id, the ego, and the superego, the mm -hmm. id is the realm of pure desire, pure drive. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> if you want to think about like the id embodied, it's like Homer Simpson. <laughs> like Homer Simpson's like duh. Mm -hmm. Like it's like mm -hmm. the direct giving voice to the id in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like the, without signification, it's just guttural in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then we have the ego mm -hmm. and then the superego. And the superego is like the voice in your head telling you this is what you should do, etc. Mm -hmm. For the psychotic, the superego dominates. Do you see what I mean? Superego dominates. Superego... Right. Is telling you something. There's external voices that contain the truth. Yours, you're in a completely hermeneutically sealed system of meaning. That's a tautology, right? Mm -hmm. Hermeneutics is already the the uh, science of mm -hmm. meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So a system of meaning that you're stuck into. Uh, last week we talked about the joke that Sartre has where the woman's on the phone with God and the psychoanalyst says, how do you know it's God? And then she says, why are you asking me? How am I supposed to know? <laughs> right? She doesn't question God because she doesn't question her own position in that. There's right. no questioning. Mm -hmm. And so if the superego is too strong, you're existing in a psychotic state. Mm -hmm. as well. Whereas if the id is enforcing too mm -hmm. much, you're existing in a neurotic compulsive state mm -hmm. because the id is compulsive. It's pushing you to do things. Mm -hmm. And so the key Freudian term is the, the idea of drive. And what we have here is a difference between repression and sublimation. Now, a drive, like an urge, uh, not an instinct, but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> difference between drive and instinct. I think I actually did a lecture on that. <laughs> so repression is when you just repress something and then it emerges constitutively. It's just something else. Right. Sublimation is actually much more interesting because sublimation is the process by which you are not sating your drive or your urge but you're doing something else. So it's not just repressed, but it's also being turned into something new. For example, mm, okay. like on a totally base organic level, mm -hmm. let's say that I really have to pee mm -hmm. and I can't pee. Mm -hmm. And so instead I start wiggling. 
<laughs> right? That's essentially, I mean, that's yeah, that's yeah. not how sublimation works, but that's how, that's essentially organic or like biological yeah. sublimation, is that mm -hmm. we can't do the one thing, so we do something else. And for Freud, that's constantly happened. It's the process of transferal. Mm -hmm. So uh, you probably heard about like the idea of makeup sex. Mm -hmm. Like a couple like goes yep. from being angry to having mm -hmm. sex. Mm -hmm. Now what's really important there is that the sex can't be an extension of the violence. <laughs> yes. Because then it's sexual <laughs> violence and that's abhorrent and terrible and, and yeah. absolutely awful that so many people mm -hmm. are subjected to that. Mm -hmm. However, the process by which the one emotional state, the state of fighting, right. goes into the state of let's have a romantic erotic encounter, right. is a process of sublimation in a sense. Hmm, You've taken okay. one thing and it's leading you into the exact opposite thing. Okay. Now, what's important for Freud is there's no point at which you're on solid or neutral ground. Hmm. All being is a form of sublimation. Okay. So already being in that angry state was a previously always already Re mediated oh. yeah. sublimation. You're just a wash in this like thing. Uh, which, to that extent, still fits within the existentialist and Frankfurt theory universe. The mm -hmm. idea that self-reflection is something that we can't escape from. That self-reflection right. is something that we're, we're tormented. No matter how much we try to break out, we're still just looking inwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, ex except there's more optimism, I think, for the existentialist about being able to do that than mm -hmm. there is for, for Freud. Mm -hmm. uh, another classic one is like if you want attention... Uh, no, if you want love, mm. if you want love from mm -hmm. someone, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to say what love is. Mm -hmm. So you say, well, instead of asking for love, I'm going to ask for attention. But it's really hard to ask for attention. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking for attention, you decide to make the other person annoyed with you. Mm -hmm. Because the most likely way to get a rise out of somebody is to annoy them. Mm -hmm. And so this is where for Freud, like the motherly figure is always a tragic figure. Because what the mother... and we're generalizing it, but what the mm -hmm. mother wants is love mm -hmm. from the child. Right. Child is not very interested. <laughs> so what the doesn't want to just give love. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, when the child loves someone else for the first time, mm -hmm. can be very traumatic for the mother in mm -hmm. a sense. So if the mother can't get love, mm -hmm. the mother will want attention. Mm -hmm. So she'll say something like, "How was your day at school?" Mm -hmm. And then the child's like, "I don't want to give you attention. <laughs> I don't want to talk about school." Mm -hmm. And so the mother will then resort to, "I'm going to nag you mm -hmm. because then I will be ensured that you will give me attention." Right. Now. Before people say this is sexist, why are you talking about mothers and not fathers? Mm -hmm. um, within the Freudian psychoanalytic universe, the mother is, in a sense, the victim of this process mm -hmm. very much because the child will have less attention for the mother than for the father because right. of the Oedipal complex, etc. Yeah. Uh, also, but it's also this dynamic of like the father gets to be the fun parent who gets to do all the fun yeah. stuff with the child, and the mother has to be the one who, you know, teaches the child to clean up after themselves, you know. Yeah, I think everybody has experienced yeah. that to some extent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure there's families that are the yeah, exception to that, or there's, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, gay parents, stuff like mm -hmm. this, whatever. And so the point being here is that sublimation is not just a one act thing. It's it's a constant, constant. process. Mm -hmm. It's a constant misrecognition mm. of what you're what the cause and effect is, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. It's the impossibility, again, if you go back to the Formula One race driver, <laughs> it's a form of sublimation that's happening, mm -hmm. which is we can't get to the ideal performance of the car mm -hmm. without introducing the material existence of the driver, which is an anomaly mm -hmm. and could cause all kinds of problems to the car. Right. And vice versa, we can't reach the ideal performance of the driver without accounting for all the material inconsistencies of a car that could blow up at any minute. Mm -hmm. And so that's it's very Freudian in that sense because we have here a form of subjectivity that is stuck. A subject that is stuck between the id and a subject that is stuck between the superego, and the best that psychoanalysis can do is to say, let's not have the superego dominate, and mm -hmm. let's not have the id dominate. Mm -hmm. In other words, psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis can't cure you, it can simply make you more comfortably stuck. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to be aware of that stuckness. And so mm -hmm. in the beginning of the class, I had this very cryptic, nonsensical thing about psychotherapy is the, uh, is the thing that exists to critique a society that thinks it needs therapy. Right. And that's exactly what it is. Because if you think that you are broken and you need to be sixed, already we have the superego dominating. Mm -hmm. The superego telling you that you are broken, There's that you need to repress the id, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. And so the process of understanding that subjectivity is the experience of being stuck between an impossible proposition of the id and the superego and making you, in a sense, be self-aware about that process mm -hmm. is the process of making you more comfortably stuck. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny because mm -hmm. I'm really into Karl Lagerfeld, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we could do a whole seminar mm-hmm. on Karl Lagerfeld because I, I've consistently be for years now been saying that I think that Lagerfeld is one of the. Uh, it would be wrong to say that he is underappreciated because mm-hmm. I think he is very widely celebrated as a fashion designer, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's widely acknowledged how much of an original thinker he was, and uh, how much of a, a interest in literature he had, and ran a publish. I mean, ran a publisher and released. Released Nietzsche translations, uh, read everything, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. very Spinoza enthusiast, all that stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things is that every once in a while he's asked about psychoanalysis, mm-hmm. usually in German. I mean, these mm-hmm. are discussions that take place at German literary conventions, mm-hmm. so it's not part of the, uh, the U- English YouTube. And um, he always jokes that his mother, being one of those, you know, uh, wealthy uh you know, uh, sort of uh, Frankfurt uh, business-owning families. Mm-hmm, His mm-hmm. father was in, uh, uh, what is it, boxed milk or something. It's like a Thomas <laughs> yeah. Mann story li- <laughs> yeah. that he lived, basically, yeah. like mm-hmm. the bourgeois gentry mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, of, of uh, northern Germany. And, I mean, Frankfurt's not northern Germany. but Hamburg, the, no? yeah, Yeah, Hamburg, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was thinking about Hamburg, not Frankfurt, sorry. Frankfurt, the financial center. Hamburg, the industrial center. At mm-hmm. least that's what it was. Um, and so... Basically, back to the point, he's asked about psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. And he says, I never did, I never undertook treatment. Mm-hmm. And in my family, this was not something that we did. Mm-hmm. And my mother would always say, Wenn du die Frage weißt, dann weißt du auch die Antwort. Which means, if you know the question, you also know the answer. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a surprisingly sophisticated dig at psychoanalysis. <laughs> because psychoanalysis actually, Freudian psychoanalysis pretty much has that same idea. Mm. If you know the question, you know the answer. Mm-hmm. And that is why I keep saying that the process of psychoanalysis is to induce hysteria into the psychotic subject. It's the in- induction of questioning. It's actually the mm-hmm. opening up mm-hmm. of a circle rather than the closing of a circle. Mm-hmm. And so, in a sense, if you can say to yourself, I already know the question and I know the answer, mm-hmm. then yeah. you don't, strictly speaking, need psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost a psychotherapeutic joke right. about psychotherapy mm-hmm. because psychotherapy is the insertion of a question. Now, it's also the reformulation of a problem Mm -hmm. because psychotherapy is about saying, you may be asking yourself questions, but those are the wrong questions you should be asking yourself, et cetera. Anyway, I I realize it sounds a bit misleading and I'm trying to fit too much in here, but the basic idea is that within the Freudo-Lacanian universe, Mm -hmm. the subject is the marker or a sign of something that is incomplete. There is no identification, pure identification of the subject with itself. There's no transparency towards itself. Mm -hmm. The subject only exists as an infinite process of misrecognition, of a failed encounter with the notion of pure subjectivity. That is what subjectivity is. And there's a beautiful question in the seminar last week. I think it was Mm Samao. He started the seminar last week by saying, you've talked about imagination and transcendental Mm -hmm. imagination. And how can you imagine something that doesn't <clears throat> exist. Mm-hmm. Something that you have no concept of. How mm-hmm. can you imagine that? Mm-hmm. And the answer that I gave to that, and I hope it didn't seem like a cop-out, was very much that same, that same idea. Which is, I don't think of the imagination as a neutral space that you can fill with pure concepts. Mm-hmm. I see the imagination as the name of that which cannot be thought. The imagination is the embodiment of that which cannot be thought. That which I cannot formalize in thought takes place in the imagination. So I can't have an imagination that thinks of something that I haven't seen yet. Right. At the same time, if I could just conceptualize the concept, it wouldn't be imagination at that point. Imagination is the realm of thought in which that which goes unthought is thought. Do you see what I mean? And that's what subjectivity is. And if you go back to the classes, you'll see how we've linked Althusser to the Freudian unconscious, to all that stuff, uh, which is that subjectivity Mm -hmm. is that which cannot be subjectivized. And here we are actually (coughs) back at Adorno Mm-hmm. If we want to rehabilitate Adorno, <laughs> which is that if ideology is identity thinking mm-hmm. and subjectivity is the insertion of difference to that homogenization, right. that which cannot be symbolized, mm-hmm. that which cannot be identified, that is the subject and that is the opposite of ideology for Adorno, mm-hmm. subjectivization. Okay. And so Adorno has this line that he writes about, I think it's in the negative dialectics, where he says, the process of breaking through ideology is the process of waking up from the illusion Mm -hmm. of constitutive subjectivity. And there's totally Mm -hmm. like a premonition here. And he's, and 
Frankfurt School uses psychoanalysis as well. Mm -hmm. Eduardo doesn't do it a whole ton, but like this mm -hmm. is part of the innovation. Mm -hmm. I think I may actually have, I don't know if I have the exact quote here before we wrap up. Uh, yeah, Adorno. We must use the force of the subject mm -hmm. to break through the deception of constitutive subjectivity. And that's mm -hmm. essentially what psychoanalysis is, mm -hmm. right? It's a theory that needs to be used to break the illusion of subjectivity. And if we break the illusion of pure subjectivity, then we will have emancipated the subject from the very illusion of self-referential identity. The emergence of genuine, quote-unquote, true subjectivity right. happens on the level of breaking the illusion of pure subjectivity. Yeah. It's almost like jumping over your own shadow. Yeah. The question is, can it be done, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, I know this is a little bit difficult, but that's, <laughs> in a sense, if you, if you want to go back, and if you're mm -hmm. a little puzzled by this, the last three lectures have revolved around this problem, mm -hmm. the problem of subjectivity and individuality. And we went from the classic problem of becoming. Right. Uh, of learning and knowing and being an agent in the world, access to being, mm -hmm. to the Sartrean existentialist conception of, of that. And we tried to introduce Adorno's version here. Mm -hmm. And by means of so doing, we're also bringing in all the elements that we're going to need in the next three lectures to talk about difference, to talk about structuralism, post-structuralism, mm -hmm. to talk about the post-Althusarians, to talk about Zizek's theory of ideology. Because we are actually, <laughs> this is the sixth class. So... The seventh class, if you've ever been in one of my classes, you know that the seventh <laughs> class is the most important one. The seventh class is the, the little pin that keeps it all together in the dialectical the chiasmic square yes. where we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Seven is the nodal point mm -hmm. in which we've reached the exact middle mm -hmm. point of the lecture series and we start working our way backwards. Yes. Uh, that's very cryptic, but <laughs> there are some of you out there who know what I'm talking about, which is enough. Um, so I want to say thank you very much for joining this class, the week six lecture to ideology. Yeah, a lot to think about. Uh, yeah, I know. It was a bit difficult, no, wasn't no, it? No, no, uh, no. Uh, can I ask you something? I mean, yes, a bit Did difficult, you, but... Was that a drip coffee you got me? It, no, it was portable. Really? Yeah. It was not very good this morning. Uh-oh. It was kind of interesting. I'm sorry. Coffee snob alert. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you would like to join our seminar, yes. head over to Clubhouse. I'm at Sublime Hysteric. Jeneline is at Jeneline. Mm-hmm. Um, or go to... And there to... is a Clubhouse channel or room called the Learning Community. Yeah, but I don't want them to go there right okay. now. Because I'm going to... Sorry, I don't want to jump on you, but I'm going to open the room under my name. And the problem is that if you all go to the Learning Community, then you'll okay. think there's no... So just go to okay. at Sublime Hysteric. Okay. Um, and we're also on Discord. Yes. So if you'd like to listen to the class on Discord and ask questions there, that's yeah. fine. Uh, you can join our Clubhouse and our Discord for just $5 a month. Mm -hmm on Patreon, which is www.patreon.com dash Jenlene and Julian. In fact, I'll type it right here for people who are interested. Uh, www.patreon and you may already be a patron, in which case, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the only way that we can keep these classes free for everybody, because we want to keep the classes 100% free mm -hmm. and accessible. I think you and I both believe in the power of online, global instant access education yes um and we don't want to paywall these classes these nope. classes are the thing we're most proud of but mm -hmm. if you'd like to be part of a small group of students who and supports not just, us and not just the live classes but also the archive of classes because yeah. julian has been doing this for now more than one year which means there are more than 52 classes yeah. if you're interested in critical theory if you're interested in Zizek, yeah uh, dialectics you could get an entire education of yeah. of this We're gonna keep by it watching way. these classes. Yes. We don't want you to have to pay anything for that. But if you'd like to support our project yes. and mm -hmm. to make it so that our community can keep doing cool stuff, mm -hmm. like when we reach $1,000, we're going to be launching our own publishing label. Yep. Uh, we're putting together the subscription service. If mm -hmm. you'd like to receive our subscription package this month, head over to patreon.com, dash Julian, mm -hmm. where you can find all that stuff. And uh, feel free to DM us. We're happy to talk about this anytime. And until then... Yes. We shall see you next time. <laughs> and we're going to be going to the clubhouse and yes. Discord room right now. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.